we're focused on having the Pith product continuously expand, more publishers cover all financial market data. And so like, if done right, then every month, the number of symbols will go up, the number of users will go up, the number of publishers will go up. And, um, and the rewards is kind of the, one of the incentives and levers that, you know, that we have to, to make sure that happens. All right, everyone. So on Empire, you obviously know that we talk a lot about the institutions coming into crypto. And that is why we are super excited to share that we are hosting the Digital Asset Summit. We've hosted this since 2019. It's coming up in London, March 18th to 20th. Don't miss your chance to get ahead of the curve. You can get 20% off with code EMPIRE20. We'll see you in London. This episode is brought to you by Toku, the first comprehensive global solution for both token compensation and tax compliance. Toku makes implementing global token compensation and incentive awards simple. With Toku, you get unmatched legal and tax support to both grant and administer your global team's tokens across the entire token lifecycle. Make your token grants easy today with Toku. All right, everyone, welcome back to Empire. Uh, really excited, we have Mike Cahill. Uh, spent time at Morgan Stanley, uh, Nomura, SIBO, uh, Jump. I uh, was running, I think, special projects at Jump. Uh, then uh, today is CEO of Duro Labs and also contributor at Pith. So Mike, welcome to the show, man. Thanks so much, excited to be here. Yeah, uh, so you guys, obviously we're gonna talk, you guys just had this big uh, token generation event. We're gonna talk about Pith and Pith token, but I think first there's like two setups to this conversation that will make the Pith conversation more fruitful. One is the Oracle problem in crypto. I would say the V1 of Oracles has been dominated by Chainlink the last couple of years. You guys are coming into that same space and maybe doing what I might call like the Oracle V2 approach. Uh, then there's this like problem that exists in traditional capital markets um, where all of the data is monopolized with these centralized exchanges like, like the NASDAQs of the world. So let's start there. Can you just give us the setup for what actually data looks like in traditional capital market structure? Yeah, absolutely. So um, 20 years ago, financial market data was never really monetized. Basically, the exchanges would monetize their executions. And then it became more and more of a component of their, um, their revenue mix. And today it accounts for 20% of the revenue um, across the top six exchanges at six and a half billion dollars. That's for real time streaming financial market that data that doesn't cover things like benchmarks. That's a, that's another multi billion dollar business. Um, so what does that model look like? So basically, when you're buying access to trade on, say, NASDAQ or NYSE, you will basically ask for a market data feed and an order entry feed, right? And so one will be um, over like a WebSocket or, or an itch um, or a REST API connection. And depending upon what type of trading you expect to do, you're going to pay different amounts and you're going to have different types of access. So if you're like a, let's say a retail brokerage, you don't really need the most sophisticated market data. So like Robinhood, if they're going to route orders to an exchange, they would say, all right, we're just going to get your most basic standard package. And the exchange is going to go, okay, right, we're going to give you a wholesale price for that. That's based on how many users Robinhood has. And if it goes up, you're going to pay a little bit more. Then if you go up one rung and you have like a Tiger or Appaloosa or more, someone like that, it's like a hedge fund. There's probably some sort of a human trader there and he runs their smart order router. Um, and from time to time, he'll have to intervene. He's going to want to have access to like the full order book look at it, place orders, watch them, cancel them, um, amend them, that sort of thing. And also from a historical perspective, they probably run some um, regression testing around performance of say like TWAPs. And so they'll wanna have all that data um, recorded and stored. And so that'll be a little bit more expensive. And then the third package is what high frequency trading firms have. And so this is the most robust data. It's down to the nanosecond. Um, and also the access to it is typically gated such that you you pay for co-location, so you're really close to their server box in Secaucus or in Aurora, depending upon which exchange that we're talking about. Um, and that's going to be the highest and sort of most optimized. Um, and so over time, this product set has matured and it has become, you know, now this top level big contributor to the revenues. Um, now, 
the thing is, the trading firms are only ever buying this. And so there has been some chagrin within those entities for a really long time because it's almost like they're giving something, you know, the, tr- the, the exchanges are monetizing the trades that just occurred. Traders are the only way that trades occur or the bids and offers where traders want to trade. Traders are the only ones that can send in bids and offers. And so they're basically giving these exchanges all of this data and then they have to buy it back. And for a long time, they were really upset with this. Um, and, and many of them still are today. Um, some are, are more vocal than others. Um, and that's just been the, the, the state of the world. So all of the world's data has been kind of financial market data has been gated, monetized by big exchanges. And then traders are just sort of stuck on the bid side and can't really participate in this mar- market and pretty unhappy. What happened 20 years ago that let them that let them do this? It was the evolution of financial markets to become more electronic. Previously, mm-hmm. it wasn't as it wasn't as necessary to have this segmentation of market data. And so I think as you and you basically used to have more human traders. So you'd be able to like have at a bank desk, for instance, you'd have like 50 human traders. And so you could say, all right, we're each one of those. They're going to have access to, you know, this particular um, order book or this um, software that allows them to trade. You'll pay for per, per seat, just like with the way that like Bloomberg monetizes, like, and it's, they're super expensive. Um, and so because there were less and less traders and most of the trade was coming through a single API, they really needed to change their business model. Um, and there was also consolidation amongst the different um, exchanges. Um, for instance, CME has bought several other exchanges, including EBS, which was the, the, the large FX order book for a long time. Um, and so this, this kind of lack of fragmentation um, and you know, these large conglomerates taking up such a, a big percentage of the market share um, allowed them to really increase their, their, their exposure. The same thing happened for FX. It just happened later. So FX was like 10 years lag to the, the equity markets, um, both on execution as well as you know, financial market data. Um, and so now it's become a big component of the, of the FX markets. It basically, for futures, it was pretty similar to, to equities. Um, and, and that's why I think all markets sort of go through this evolution. And like crypto today is in those like 20 years ago phase where right. most of the exchanges within crypto don't charge anything yet because they're thinking about it as, well, we actually probably need to grow the pie a bit first. And it's a good marketing tool, like having the Binance price feed on TradingView is like a useful way for Binance to get its name out. And um, the more people that are trading, like, you know, you can extract the costs later. But for now, it's just like, let's let's just think about this from a marketing perspective. The one outlier is probably Coinbase because they have such an institutional coverage model within the US and a lot of DNA from banks. They already have a pretty robust uh, business model around financial market data. Although I don't know that their enforcement is anywhere near the enforcement that like NASDAQ or NYSE has. So still people use it. And, um, and, and there's some, you know, level of kind of, you know, quasi commercialism, commercialization around it. Hmm. Do you think they'll also, so is, is that the natural evolution of crypto exchanges is right now they kind of treat it, their data as like this top of funnel, pull in more users, get the, the Binance brand awareness out there. But, you know, maybe fast forward three to five years, they'll start monetizing their data. This becomes a big business line for them, like it does for you know, NYSE or NASDAQ. Yes, I would, I would heavily predict that to be the case. Yeah. Okay. So that's the, okay. So one bucket here with, with Pith, we have uh, this problem in traditional capital markets where all the data is monopolized. Talk to me about the uh, the crypto oracle problem and like how some of that financial information uh, streams into the apps, right? Like an Aave or Compound today. Pre, let's let's go pre pith. Yeah, Oracle 1.0 model was so or, the the model was um, take the data from the internet and put it onto the blockchain um, and do it in a way where you preserve trust. The the, the Oracle 1.0 model looks a little bit like a bridge. Um, so it doesn't have any particularly proprietary or in-network access to data. It's just basically saying like, look, there'll be some endpoints on the internet and we can use those endpoints if we have enough nodes and those nodes will run a very simple aggregation where you get like, say 10 nodes who are, who are replicating the price of CoinGecko on chain. 
and they'll do it every so often and, and it'll be good enough every so often, meaning like they'll push an update every hour or 50 basis points. Um, now that works for, for crypto data because of the phenomenon I mentioned, it's, it's, it's immature in its life cycle. If crypto data was already protected, then, you know, that business model wouldn't work. You would have to go buy that data and then buying data means that you're subject to the terms and conditions of it. So you don't get uncontrolled distribution rights to it. So there's this like temporary time where, you know, you get this bootstrappy way to create a solution to the Oracle problem. The Oracle problem is how do you bring exo exogenous data on chain in a trustworthy way? And, and it involves nodes that are going, grabbing it from the internet, replicating it, publishing it, but they add all this latency. It takes a long time for them to do this. And then because it's being published as a push on chain, you need to be kind of gas conservative. And so you basically don't want to, you, you want to publish it as infrequently as possible. And so you basically end up with this very low resolution um, feed uh, that doesn't track super, super well to kind of the, the updated or high speed markets. What, do, what does low resolution mean in this case? So if you've predefined the the epochs with which you're going to publish data on chain to one hour or 50 basis points, 50 basis points is the is basically the resolution. You're basically saying we're going to have a heartbeat that comes every every one hour, irrespective of the delta in that time period, or it has to move 50 basis points. So um, if you think about like just pixel resolution um, as being like this 50 basis points requiring a print, anything below that is going to you know not be printed. And so that's, you know, that's where I think about low resolution. Financial markets, mm -hmm. you know, go out to several decimal points. Um, and, you know, with things like leverage, those can be incredibly meaningful. Um, and so there's been like the general evolution of markets as they become electronic is that they update more frequently and that there's generally more specificity um, or granularity with the prices. Hmm. So Oracle model 1.0, Chainlink, all this info is available on the internet, right? So then you have nodes scraping the models online, then they publish it to the blockchain. Why do we need to necessarily like improve the latency of Oracle data today? Like Compound doesn't need low latency, right? They don't as is. Um, so for the very first kind of um, proof of concept, lending protocols, you don't really need to have very fast markets because you're not going to have really high loan to value um, levels anyway. So what you really need for what you really need high speed oracles for is applications that are going to take advantage of a high speed oracle. So some of those would be like on chain perpetual markets. Mm. Now, if you're running an on chain perpetuals market using a slow oracle, then it can be arbitraged very easily. Like, like, a, like a synthetics, for example. Yeah, so synthetics is a great example. So synthetics was on V1 using Chainlink. They created a V2. Um, they launched the V2 at the beginning of, of this year um, and evaluated at that time the best oracles out there that would suit their needs. Um, and the governance chose Pith as the oracle to use for as their primary oracle for execution because it's the fastest and has the lowest latency. And mm -hmm. that was an, that enabled them to really sort of leapfrog, um, you know, some of the competitors that had caught up during the, um, the time where they, they hadn't had that and became a very big force with regards to perpetuals on chain. Hmm. It's funny, I feel like this low latency of data in, in, uh, in like OG DeFi has actually been a it sounds like a negative, but sometimes it kind of saves DeFi, uh, right? Oracle's being slow to report volatility ends up sometimes on, on days like, you know, March of 2020. I'm sure Santi knows 10 times more about this than I do because he's actually experienced it in depth. But uh, sometimes it can actually help DeFi in a way. Well, I, I would probably make it a more precise statement, which is it's more so the way you calculate the price feed. Like it, it's some of the where mistakes have been made in DeFi is where you always, I think, want to have a constant and as as like constant real time data feed, but the way you calculate the, the price is sort of like in a, in a smooth out manner, which is not taking a specific data point, but taking the average of the last five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. And every, a lot of the mistakes that have been done uh, and exploits have been because 
a lot of DeFi protocols, the way they, they, the price feeds that they're using are just relying on a single data point and not a combination to triangulate to the best price. Mm-hmm. And that's where like Compound was affected by this. Like even the, the, the what I'm trying to say is some of the best DeFi protocols have made this mistake and have learned from it. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and I think that the fact that th- there, there are way better ways to architect a lending protocol so that it's not subject to exploits rather than just using a slow Oracle. <laughs> I yeah, know what you're talking right, about. Yeah. No, and if I these remember, markets need to evolve, then we need, then we need better <laughs> yeah. and faster data. Yeah, of course. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's like the, the point is if, if the best thing we can come up with from a, le- from our lending protocol in two years is compounds current instantaneous instance, um, you know, that'd be pretty depressing. So I'm, yeah. I'm pretty optimistic that there's going to be a use case for higher fidelity market data within an or within a, a lending protocol. It's just they'll probably have different mechanisms that all defend against flash attacks or, right. or volatility mm-hmm. spikes. Like you, you should yeah. be conservative with your LTVs or you should be conservative during periods of high volatility. So one of the things that Pith also uh, innovated was the aggregation is a tricky part. So as Santi mentioned, right, if, you, if you're dealing with a single point, um, especially during high volatility, that's going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. And when we were building the, you know, the PITH network, we kind of had this first principles discussion, like what is the price of Bitcoin right now? <laughs> you know, if, if we have 10 data sources, is it the average? Um, it's, it's probably not the best representation. Um, the more data sources you get, sure, it's a, a better representation, but it's still imperfect. Um, for instance, how do you represent the fact that there is going to be anomalies based on the idiosyncrasies of um, like funding rates or mm-hmm. the access to a, a restricted currency market like kimchi premiums? So you actually do want to represent that in real time. So what we came up with was called confidence intervals, and Pith is the only oracle that has these. So in real time, every price from Pith is aggregated together. Um, but along with the aggregate, each price has a confidence band. It says plus or minus price. So if the price of Bitcoin is 37000 it could see plus or minus $200. And this fluctuates at every single update. And in periods of high volatility, what you could do if you're building you know, a smart kind of collateral evaluation, you could... Yeah, there you go. Um, you could say, all right, if the confidence interval is quite wide right now, we're going to limit the amount of collateral you can contribute for a period Mm -hmm. of time. Um, And those are smart ways to address this. And then it becomes more dynamic because with a lending protocol, you don't necessarily want to be the most conservative to all like the 99th percentile incidents. Like that would just give you a pretty low leverage product. You want to assume that you know, during 99% of the time, you can give high leverage because that's what would make your protocol more attractive. But you have de- defense mechanisms in place such that you don't get blown up by black, black swan events. Um, and, you know, this is one way to do it. And then another way to do it is is using things like TWAPs and, um, you know, all those stuff are, are available on, on Pith as well. Um, what's the confidence on your con- confidence intervals? <laughs> that is a good idea. <laughs> no, Very I mean, like, confidence. I'm, I'm sure you've had, I mean, I'm speculating here because I don't know, but have you actually changed the way you think about and calculate confidence intervals? <laughs> We've changed the aggregation technique since the very beginning. Um, <laughs> so now the way that um, aggregation is constructed, it filters out um, outliers pretty well. So each one of the publishers basically gets three votes on what the price is. And so they get their their price and then their price plus the confidence plus and then minus the confidence. So every publisher within the Pith Network has to publish a price and a confidence. Um, and then all of those votes are plotted and you end up with something called a weighted median. And then the algorithm creates a... Laplace distribution based on all of the inputs to come up with the aggregate confidence interval. And it tracks fairly well. Um, It also has characteristics where if you have these outliers and you have a cluster of outliers, then the confidence will represent that cluster. 
um, but it won't necessarily skew the average price or the aggregate price to the the, the cluster of bad prices. Because mm -hmm. you basically want the output to, in plain English, say, look, the real price seems to be, or where all the trading happened seems to be 36000 But there's some stuff that's trading plus or minus $1,000, which indicates high volatility. And that's really good information. You know, that's that's better information than saying, you know, it's skewed up 1000 and then having some average that shows you something that's mm -hmm. a, kind of a bad price in, in both instances. Yeah. So you, you're normalizing, but you're also paying attention to these anomalies? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Because that could indicate there's an exploit, there's a flash line, a particular DeFi protocol, there's some sort of funky thing going on with your data providers that needs to be addressed. Exactly. Mike, can you actually, can we just zoom back out for a second here? Can you go back, like take us back to Jump. My understanding is uh, Pith came out of Jump. You were like- well, We were so happy going really deep, Jason. I mean, as much as I like confidence <laughs> yeah. intervals, I'm like, uh, I, gotta, I gotta understand Pith before we go into these- well, I wonder how many people dropped off over this like we last few minutes of those just talking about confidence intervals. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, if you're still here and listening, kudos. Like, you, know, <laughs> you get a, some- you know, pat in the back, but anyway, so so let's go back to the origin story, I guess. Yeah, right you now. guys, you guys flipped the model, right? Now the now instead of the exchanges uh, owning the data, the the funds are actually saying, "Hey, we've got this data. Let's let's band together." But take us back to the days of Jump and how this kind of project came to be. Yeah, so um, in 2020, uh, I was working at Jump, and we were involved in a lot of basically trading and partnering with a lot of projects. There was a lot of vesting as well. And there was a big thesis conversation looking at some of the bottlenecks around the markets. And when we did deep dives, we, we, we basically realized that there was two areas that were going to really constrain the short-term growth of DeFi. And the first one was the solution to the Oracle problem, which is Oracle's 1.0. Um, we thought that with, these, with this low resolution data, it was never going to be able to do anything interesting from an application perspective. You could basically do lending protocols and that's about it. And that's really all it did like with, with um, DeFi 1.0. Um, the other one that we thought was a, a big limitation was, was around um, bridging. Um, but at the time we had basically, we talked to other trading firms and we, we realized that the solution for the Oracle problem was to get, you know, data directly from the source. And we combine these two problems together that we mentioned in the beginning, right? So the Oracle problem, Oracle 1.0 wasn't that great. And number two, like most of the data is owned by the exchanges. And we started talking to exchanges and said, you know, if, if you guys were to publish your data on chain, you know, that would be create a potentially very interesting product for solving this other Oracle problem. And it would potentially give you a new revenue source and, um, you know, combat that monopoly in the web three space. Um, and very quickly, the idea resonated. So the first, the first companies that joined into the network that um, were kind of founding members uh, were Virtu, GTS, uh, MyX, um, LMAX, and a few others. And that's really where the idea was born. So Jump was a, a contributor, started doing a lot of the development. Um, but really, it was a you know, it was a collective, um, and then the collective grew quickly. So today there's over 100 publishers, all institutions, and the development is mostly done from Dural Labs, the company that I'm the CEO of now. Hmm. Uh, I remember talking to Colleen Sullivan from Brevin about this project early on, um, when I think she was still at CMT, and she said, look, the craziest thing about this is you have a bunch of firms who are hyper uh, confident, like uh, sensitive with their own data, and they never, and they they're hyper competitive as well. And now they're all collaborating and working together. How did you get like Jump and Virtu, for example, to work together here? Yeah, you would never expect. You think it's like cats and dogs, and we actually thought this right. when when we were when we'd gone out with the idea. Um, it it just so happens that there's two two things. Number one, there's like a bigger cat, which is the financial market data is something that everyone deals with and is, is incredibly frustrated by. And number two, the innovations of blockchains allow distrusting people to have incentive mechanisms to collaborate on something that gets shared as a common good for other people. That wouldn't be possible. There is no way 
that Virtue, Jump, Jane Street, DRW would enter into any sort of an LLC for any kind of profit sharing or information sharing in a traditional sense. If there was a single shared, if there was a single database owned by just one of those companies, it would never happen. It's all the innovations around blockchains that allowed this. It's not owned by anybody. No one has preferential access to it. The aggregation contract lives on the blockchain and everyone publishes to it. Um, so it's equitable access for all of the contributors as well as all the users. That was, a, that was an important innovation. And then there was a model that was described at the time on how the publishers were going to be incentivized for, for providing their data. And that was what really resonated with people. But like, okay, let's, let's unpack that for a bit because if you're Jump, you're at the peak of the bull market, you're, you think you have an edge. I don't know, but I'm speculating. You think you have an edge, you think you have a better price feed, and that gives you a huge advantage over all the other cats and dogs out there. And so no matter how, like, I, th I got to think like the economic incentive is kind of like not there there to provide the data and get paid to contribute to this like Switzerland model of like a data feed. Because if you fundamentally believe that you have an edge, then it's sort of like an adverse selection problem. All the underdogs do have an incentive to provide the data. And is then what you're saying, <laughs> that aggregation of that data was enough to convince the guy that thinks it has the most amount of edge on the table to finally come forth and provide the data, but it takes time? Or does that make sense? Because yeah, like, yeah. If, I, if I feel that I have the edge, no fucking way I'm going to contribute. I'm like, no, this is my data. <laughs> Everyone else can like not have an edge. Yeah, I think there, there's there's a small nuance here as well, which is the, the timescale resolution that we need to focus on. So the fastest timescale possible within blockchains today is quite slow for the traditional finance markets. And so the traditional finance markets, you're dealing with sub milliseconds, like um, nanoseconds in some of the markets um, in terms of the, the, the alpha and the resolution that you, you, you need to, to be competitive. The fastest t times within blockchains right now, pith updates every 400 milliseconds. So the, the scale of magnitude there is in the you know, thousands times um, uh, category. So from their perspective, some of the data has already decayed or some of the alpha has already decayed for traditional markets. Um, but now we're still at the fastest update times possible on blockchains because of the binning of around 400 milliseconds. So for now, you know, we have this paradigm. If blockchains were to become much faster, and to have like feature parity, then I think the, the model would need to change a bit. There would need to be some protection of the data, of the visibility of the data for a period of time before it gets released. Um, but that's not yet a problem. Okay. Um, and so I just want to understand and go back to something that we've talked about earlier, which is, of course, you see the opportunity that Chainlink's not particularly addressing, but like, can you just crystallize like, what is the real advantage maybe from a, if you're like synthetics or some of these other protocols choosing their data provider, their Oracle, um, are, I've always felt that the Oracle space is not winner take all. You want to have redundancy. And so like I was involved, like in the early days of synthetics, they were running their own Oracles and making the transition to chain link. Seeing that happen gave me a finer appreciation of like, maybe you want to have not just one data provider, like one Oracle uh, provider like Chainlink, but m many others, because um, the risk of messing it up is really high. So do you have a sense of like the projects you're working with, um, how many of them are have Chainlink and are working with Chainlink? Or are you replacing Chainlink? Are you complementing Chainlink? Like, how do you think about that? Yeah, in the case of Synthetics, uh, because I think that it's a good example, they, they still have Chainlink as a backup. Um, but the way that it works is it's a toggle um, to determine whether or not pith should be used um, or basically trading should be used, right? Mm -hmm. So so pith is the primary um, oracle. If you trade on synthetics, then you're, you're leveraging a pith price. Um, now, if pith and chain link disagree over a time period, like, it, and it doesn't need to be super high resolution, it could be like, you know, the, the moving averages are, are, have gone off out of, out of whack. Um, then they say, you know, everything off, something's wrong here. I think that's a pretty good way to hold on to the side of the pool. Um, the the bad approach would be to just like average two th two oracles together. Um, that yeah, that would just 
they yeah, both, that would, that would both maybe wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then you just end up with a bad product because yeah. you know. You remember when search engines were coming out? Um, they at first it was like there was a bunch of search engines, and then there was like the aggregator, like Dogpile, would be like the search engine of other search engines. Um, and then people realized actually the thing that you want is just the best search results. Um, you don't you don't want to have like a bunch of you know bad search engines included. And so I think that's probably the the right way to think about like an Oracle or mm -hmm. a primary Oracle. No, I, I think a redundancy makes sense. Um, and so Pith today covers about 25% of the applications that use an Oracle. Um, the other 75% use different Oracles. Um, Chainlink's obviously the largest there. Pith has only gone cross chain 11 months ago um, from its first chain of Solana, and now it's on 40 different blockchains. So most of that growth has happened in, in the last 11 months. And basically, it's been three new applications per week have integrated Pith. Um, yeah. So I, I would say that there's there's probably some redundancy. Um, but if you do if you do redundancy really well, within a single protocol, I don't think that there's need for a separate one. Um, yeah. I think that like Pith could could be a redundant solution there. There are sort of backups that um, that are available as well. And like Pith has a, if you click on a Pith price, you'll see like the, the EMA. Um, and then there's some stuff that are being rolled out mm -hmm. regards to like putting together any kind of arbitrary TWAP. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can use those as good, good kind of checks as well. Um, mm -hmm. Although I, I do think that competition within the Oracle space is smart. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, if Chainlink does introduce new products and those are things that require the, the, the Pith protocol to react, like that's probably mm -hmm. good for the entire ecosystem. Yeah. So Chainlink, uh, we're looking at charts here for people seeing video, but like Chainlink, uh, this is DeFi Lana data, by the yeah. way. So Chainlink secures or uh, 366 protocols. You guys do little under half of that, 125. In terms of total value served, I guess, um, or secured, Chainlink is like roughly 15 billion. What, you what guys is this, like Winklink? Oh, that's the Justin Sun um, for. Wait, Jason, yeah. you can't you can't switch it up. You're missing. Uh, no, no, then... I was I was I was toggling between. So if you, I mean, she... this is interesting. Like Chainlink's three sixty six, Pith is one twenty five protocol secured, but Chainlink has fourteen times more. Yeah, yeah. Total I think value. that the the real metric, I guess, is value secured. Maybe Pith is a fraction. You know, Chainlink is close to fifteen billion. You guys are one point six billion. So walk us through like. What do you need to believe for you guys to, if, if uh, to your earlier point, redundancy may not be necessary and you could just have one really good Oracle solution. If, if you guys believe that, then what would need to happen for you guys to flip Chainlink? Yeah. So they're, they're, the, the majority of that total value secured is consolidated around Ave and Compound. So like it's, it's mostly, mm -hmm. mostly those two apps. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just sort of the nature of, of how um, value locked on chain is right now. I don't think that's the best metric for an Oracle. Um, I think it's a good one. It shows you which lending protocols are using um, are using an Oracle. It definitely shows you something that's at, at risk. So I, you know, securing is, is an important component of it. Um, the other component I think that's important to, to add, um, and you know, hopefully DeFi Llama adds this at some point, but it's the total value traded that's secured. Mm -hmm. And so every time someone's trading something that is using an Oracle, like that volume kind of should be counted up. Um, and in this model in particular, it makes more sense for, for basically two reasons. Number one, it's, it's the primary users, like the synthetics of the world. Um, you know, they're the ones that are going to be most focused on low latency. The other element of it is that's actually the way that the protocol collects fees from the Pith protocol collects fees. So each time there's a trade, there's a fee that gets paid through the network today, the fees are set to, to next to zero, but not zero. Um, and governance yeah. can choose to, to update that. Now governance is live. Um, Wait, sorry, Mike, can you say that one more time? So like when you do a trade on synthetics, what, what happens is, uh, I'll, I'll give you the whole workflow just so that you're, you, you, just so I can articulate yeah, yeah, that yeah. there's no latency <laughs> as well. <laughs> um, but basically you, you do a trade, you see a price on the GUI and that price is actually reading off of PithNet. And you click to execute, and a message is sent from Optimism to PithNet saying, hey, we'd like to bring the price from this timestamp time 
um, that Jason just tried to execute or just executed. And so it goes back, you know, whatever, like 400 milliseconds and sends that, that price over. And then you execute the trade and you pay a fee. And that fee has three components to it. There's the gas on optimism. There's the fee that Synthetics charges you if you're a maker or a taker. And then there's a small fee that Pith charges as well. And so every time a Pith price is delivered to one of these 40 different blockchains, a fee is, is paid to Pith. And right now the fees are all set to effectively nothing. Um, but they're set such that people are paying in, in Pith is accumulating fees. There are, I think, over 2 million fee paying transactions per day. Um, and so as governance chooses to um, figure out what fees are kind of appropriate, we'll see how that number of transactions changes. Like it, it, it may go down a bit, it may go down a lot, uh, may not go down that much, um, depending upon you know how those, those dials are changed. Yeah. Yeah. So the, it really is around utilization, no different than like, you know, TVL is kind of like a very crude metric. It's really, you know, if you look yeah. at Uniswap, it's the best DEX because it has a high utilization on the pools because everyone's trading there. Um, and so you care less about, you know, you, you care less about how much value is being secured. You care more about the type of protocols, I guess, that work that are working with you. If you're like a, a high frequency kind of type of DeFi application, then you're going to earn way more fees relative to a very kind of uh, low like activity protocol. Exactly. Yeah. Given this business model that I've just described, right? The a lending protocol is not a very profitable <laughs> client. Now there are other business models <coughs> that will make more sense for lending protocols um, that I can envision and could potentially be rolled out in the future, and would actually work for helping them kind of secure and perhaps monetize their. Um, their kind of protocol a little bit better. Like what's the, when you think about like revenue projections, how do you, how do you think about that? Like, is this a, what's the market opportunity? Like what's your guys's, I'm, I'm sure you can't give too specific of numbers here. But like <laughs> when you think about revenue, like what is the scale? How many zeros are behind the one, uh, in, you know, fast forward a couple of years here. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's so hard to predict um, because there are so many assumptions, particularly around like, you know, what is, what is the market opportunity for DeFi? Um, so like on-chain derivatives today are like sub 1% of Binance futures. Um, I think that in a year, they'll be over 10%. Um, you know, and so that gives you a sense of like a first kind of really scaling and growing. Um, now, what what are people going to be paying on those, and like what percentage will go to market data? For that one, it's it's difficult because you'll start to basically find an equilibrium by like starting pretty small, pretty small. But if you zoom out and you just say, well, you know, you asked me in the beginning, is this how the crypto markets develop? And you know, that's my prediction is yes. So at maturity, you could say the revenue model for DeFi will perhaps look in such a way where 20% of the revenue goes to the market data. And if the market data is all done via oracles, then, you know, perhaps it's 20% of the revenues of DeFi. Um, so I think that, you know, is, is, is decent enough as a, a bad heuristic um, it, because all the other heuristics are going to be highly speculative based on assumptions that have very low conviction. Yeah. What about, uh, I want to get into the token in a second, but, um, what about non-financial data? Yeah, I, I, I like non-financial data conceptually. Um, I, the, the thing that Pith has done really well has been take highly valuable data and incentivize users to make it available to everyone with a business model that will work. Um, things that are just like the public, in the public domain, I think are a little bit less interesting. Um, there's perhaps some requirements to just get them on. Um, and if there is like a, a big use case for, I don't know, weather data or things like that, then, you know, I can see that, you know, Pith would eventually expand to it. But for the moment, there's, they're just not highly valuable data sources. And, and there's also no clear avenue of application sector that is really building something unique there. You know, DeFi is really one of the biggest potential use cases for blockchains. And so financial market data is a linchpin. Therefore, yeah. if you can be specialized and you can look like Bloomberg, 
you know, you can kind of own that segment as opposed to Google, which, you know, Google, Google finance is not used on wall street anywhere. Um, so I think that there's, there's a lot to it, but that said, there's no reason why PIF data couldn't be expanded or PIF data sources couldn't be expanded to other types. There are other types of data though, <coughs> that I think could be, could be pretty interesting to, to add in the future stuff like, um, credit scores, um, if done in a way that preserves a bit of privacy, uh, would be pretty interesting. Um, and then there's a couple of other things that we, we've kind of just ex like thrown against the wall that I think would be, would be pretty cool to add at, at some point. All right, everyone. So we talk a lot about the institutions coming into crypto on Empire. Santi and I are both headed out to London, March 18th to 20th for Blockworks' eighth ever Digital Asset Summit, DAS. This is an institutional buttoned up conference that we've hosted since 2019. I like to joke that it is probably the last remaining kind of suit and tie event in crypto. People are still wearing suit and tie. It's pretty funny, but you'll actually hear from a lot of the largest institutions in the world coming from Standard Charter, FIS, JP Morgan, Framework folks coming out, Wintermute, Van Eck, Goldman Sachs. There are a couple big themes of this conference. One, Bitcoin Catalyst, the halving and the spot ETF. Two, a view from the buy side. Three, RWA's token organization and stable coins, four global regulatory frameworks, five institutional infrastructure, including banking and payments, and six, the macro case for crypto. If you have anything to do with the institutional side of crypto, you have to be there. Santi and I got your back. We hooked you up with a 20% off code. It is Empire20. There is a little competition running internally at Blockworks to see who can drive the most number of tickets. So help Santi and I out, register with our code and you get 20% off. That is Empire20. This episode is brought to you by Toku, the first comprehensive global solution for token compensation and tax compliance. If you say yes to any of the following four questions, Toku is a no brainer solution for you. Number one, are you planning to launch a token? Number two, is your token already live? Number three, are you currently granting your employees or contractors vesting token awards? And number four, are you trying to figure out how to take care of taxable token events for your team? If yes, you have to get in touch with the Toku team. Toku to high level makes implementing global token compensation and incentive awards simple. You get unmatched legal and tax support to both grant and administer your global team's tokens. Toku navigates this across the entire token lifecycle, from easy to use token grant, award templates, through tracking vesting to managing tax withholdings. Toku makes it simple for leading companies in the space, including Protocol Labs, DYDX Foundation, Minna Foundation, Adara, Gnosis Safe, Getcoin, and many more. Reach out to Toku, that is toku.com forward slash empire, T-O-K-U.com forward slash empire. Click the link in the description or DM me on Twitter and I'll get you connected to the team. What's the role of the token? The token is a governance token. And what so... What does that exactly mean? <laughs> yeah, so the um, the... the, the the PIF network is a decentralized oracle, um, and it's designed to be run by the community. Um, and so the token is the, the way to govern the network. Um, and the token has now been distributed to over 95,000 um, wallets and users. Um, historically, it was just a you know middleware B2B infrastructure network. Um, and it was a successful one, you know, as we've sort of talked about, we've, you know, amassed over hundred publishers. Um, there are 225 applications that are using, or hundred, I guess on the DeFi Llama numbers, it, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit lower, but 125 applications that are using Pith. Um, and that has been done in a series of checks to, you know, confirm that this is the right idea, right? There was this hypothesis that DeFi needs low latency, high, high frequency oracles um, in order to be successful. And so the first way you're going to do that is, well, if you can get enough users within the network or publishers within the network to create that data so that you don't need to go and ask NASDAQ or NYSE. So that was done. The second one was, well, if you've created this data, do people really care about it or do they really want just slow data? So that was step number two, was when PIF launched on Solana and stood out there as the, the primary oracle. Over 90% of the applications use, use Pith. And number three was, can you build up a cross-chain 
Oracle model um, that requires people to pay some fee, have prices be delivered cross chain. Um, that happened earlier this year. So we basically passed these three proof points. And now it's a time to, you know, we've gotten out of this experimentation mode and we can move on to letting the community decide how to govern things going forward. So all the updates will get turned over, multi-sig will be turned over to governance. And then governance will control things like which symbols to be added, um, which new publishers to be added, how should rewards work? Do we add new segments of data, such as weather, um, credit mm -hmm. scores, things like that? Um, does the aggregation logic need to change? Should we have a new um, fee model for lending protocols and things like that? It, so the, 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 the governance <clears throat> is going to be managed by users. And what has been really cool about this airdrop is that it's retroactive airdrop is that the, the end users really just got told about Pith perhaps for the first time by seeing that they qualified for this airdrop. Because Pith is this, you know, this middleware B2B company, it's almost like ARM or you know, NVIDIA. Everyone knew about NVIDIA because they had a stock and you know, people could speculate on it. And ARM, people didn't necessarily know about until they had a stock. Um, now, you can assume that there's people that want to trade different symbols on, say, a synthetics, but they don't have the ability to ask for the Oracle to you know, make those symbols available. They now can. They can participate in the governance. And so this is the, the way to invite them to the community and say, yeah, like you have a bag, then okay, I want Pith to, to service the protocol that I'm trading with. But what does the average DGen know about oracles and the way, like, like confidence intervals? Like, they have no business in understanding that. Nor do you want them to be governing that candidly. Like, this should just be a SaaS business. As much as I'm a token maximalist, like, I just don't see it. Like, like what needs to be governed that, like, the wisdom of the crowds, which is not so wise or has been, and DAO participation is terrible. Why even introduce that? And why not just keep executing as a team, run an incredibly profitable business model like Bloomberg has, and call it a day? Yeah, I think that the ethos of it is to have it be decentralized. Now, I agree that if you if you do the, the decentralization or the governance wrong or poorly, then you ossify a you know, a protocol and, and you, and you don't get it to develop yeah. any further. It's, it's and, like if United Airlines all of a sudden gave everyone points in the ability to, to determine if they should be using Rolls Royce as some other provider for jet engines and, and, and the community yeah. somehow like decides to use like a <laughs> shitty jet engine manufacturer. Well, guess what folks, I'm not going to fucking fly United after that. <laughs> I, I I, I'm sure. exaggerating here, but like, you know, my point, like I, I'm yeah. just, uh, yeah, exactly. Point. But I mean, it goes to the, like, what is the utility of governance token? Um, and, you know, if, 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 theoretically, if you're buying a, a share of, of, of ARM, you, you get a, a say on the proxy and um, you get a vote for somebody. I think good governance will evolve into things like this. Like Synthetics does a good job. They've got these, these councils. And so you, you, you end up creating an agile environment where people actually get to make decisions over the period of their tenure. And then they go and run for council again. Um, and, and they, they ship, like they have new versions, um, and there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's a dynamic, it's a dynamic protocol versus something like say Ave or compound where, you know, the, the governance model is completely different and it doesn't move nearly as fast. Are you subsidizing part of the fees or incentivizing projects to work with you guys? And has that become easier because you have a token and you can like subsidize or incentivize them to work with you in a kind of referral manner? Um, that's not something we're actively doing, but part of the, the retroactive airdrop um, did include protocols that were um, that were using Pith. And so during the snapshot window, um, there was an allocation that went to the end users, and then there was allocation that went to the protocols, DAOs, or treasuries um, themselves. Yeah. So that's a very big number. I think you, you said 90,000 wallets or so? Yeah, 90,000 wallets. And it, was, it involved 27 blockchains in terms of the the that's usage it's the lar largest mm -hmm. cross-chain airdrop of all time yeah so so basically if you used an application on 27 different blockchains um you could have been eligible for pith um for the pith airdrop 
Um, and what I think people real like what I started to see over the last year, week since the tokens come out, um, number one, so many more people heard of uh, heard, heard of Pith. It felt a little bit like the the overnight success that was three years in the making. Um, no one really appreciated the fact that there were so many protocols that were integrating or that there were so many publishers in the network. The business model wasn't quite clear to people. The fact that there was these two dilemmas wasn't necessarily clear to people. Um, and so, so that was that was amazing. The other element of it is that because there are so many participants within the network, a lot of this stuff can be made to look quite easily pretty quickly. So the token distribution mechanism was, okay, well, let's just look at who's using these protocols. There's a lot of users. There wasn't a, okay, we're going to have this thing where, you know, people are in our test net and playing around and we're going to try and figure out which ones are Sybils and which ones are, you know, airdrop farming. It, you know, it, it was quite simple to be able to make it relatively um, like Sybil resistant because we had a long history of, of users. Um, and then the other thing was the token was then listed on a number of exchanges. Well, majority of those exchanges are publishers within the Pith network. There are 10 of them that are actually publishers from OKEX, Bybit. Um, you know, there, there's, there's many that are already part of this protocol. And then there's market making firms who are trading their token and, you know, all, all, all those are in the network. So when you amass these, these participants, a whole lot is possible very quickly. Um, if you've done the legwork. And so I think that's what's been kind of most eye-opening to to me is that, you know, all the work that was put in, especially during the bear market, has really now paid off because there's so much possibility. And, and, and it won't necessarily slow down. There are, you know, there's a good argument to be made where new segments of publishers may join the network from mm -hmm. asset managers to banks. And it won't just happen like the one-off. It's similar to the trading firms, when they get the model, it happens really, really quickly. Yeah. Um, so I, I think a large part of what you're describing in the inception story was like this like credibly neutral Switzerland model to provide dump your data and get some sort of compensation if you're within, you know, if you're providing accurate data. That was working and it doesn't sound like, I mean, you were successful in convincing a lot of people, right, that wouldn't work otherwise. And you solved that coordination and incentive problem, and you created all this value. Um, so oftentimes you need a token to do that. But in this case, you were successful pre-token because you had all the major, sounds like you had a lot of the best data providers out there. For, from their perspective, does a token matter? Is it a distraction from them? Do they get compensated in what is now a more volatile unit of account? Or do they like the idea of having this token and maybe participating in governance in some way, shape, or form? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to think that they're, they, they'd be interested in participating in governance. Um, many of them, I think, are. But the, you know, the reality is that there's 22% of the supply that's reserved for rewards uh, for publishers um, that is, has kind of been set already in the, in the white paper. Um, and that's really been the carrot. You know that's inflation, and so if you know fees don't pick up for a while, then you know there's there's these rewards that will be able to be used to incentivize them, and a lot of a lot of the publishers are motivated by this. Now, if you just paid them in cash, then what what they would try and do to optimize for maximizing their profit would be to go and connect to as many marketplaces or oracles as possible, and so having them incentivized, you know, with something that's like the you know. The, the PIF network token or governance token, they're a little bit more aligned with the long-term success of the project. Um, and so, you know, there's obviously- Would it backfire if the, pro if, if the token value collapsed 90%? Does that backfire? Um, I mean- I mean, I guess it also, like economically, like if, if the value of all the thing that you're securing and the swaps just goes down 90% as well, because everything's so correlated in crypto, then they're not making as much money. And so they may detract, they may leave, they may be still incentivized to work with as many providers to make up for the loss kind of like money. Yeah, sure. I think, I think there is like the getting the rewards right is a, is a good idea, <laughs> is, is basically um, my response to that is if you have inflation structured poorly, 
then you're going to have a problem with the, you know, the emissions of the supply coming out too fast. Um, if it's done too slowly, then you've got other problems where, you know, people aren't necessarily getting compensated for even their kind of fixed costs. Um, and they're, they're kind of incentivized to walk away. Um, so I don't have like a great answer for how it, how it will work. I, you know, this will be something that kind of gets proposed to governance. Um, we'll probably have a, a couple of different models that Dora Labs will propose. Um, but I, you know, I think there's a way for this to work and be equitable and have a long-term economic model that survives for, you know, many years. Yeah. That's one of the things that, uh, you know, DPIN is all the rage these days, but it's been around for such a long time. And I think one of the biggest criticisms that I have, and I've heard as well shared by others is that the rewards are very simplistically modeled and should be more dynamic um, based on the contribution. It becomes hard. It's like milestone kind of fundraising. It's just like, how do you, how do you like express that in a smart contract or like in a vesting, like, you know, in a reward um, mechanism. But I'm curious, like in, in a perfect world, like maybe share with us kind of how you think about this um, reward mechanism and perhaps changes that could be done or that you may be proposing. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't have like um, really well thought out answers on exactly how it would work, but I'd it say that like, it's working fine now. It, it is, is right? working fine now. Yes, um, it's it's kind of early days for for the rewards, um, but but basically, I think the rewards should be used to incentivize markets that don't yet have a tremendous amount of demand, but eventually will. Um, and if you can do that sparingly so that you're not overpaying for things to get on, um, you know, on, on chain and you can do it so that it's, it's constantly expanding the network, then the product set becomes better. And that's really what, you know, what we're focused on. We're focused on having the Pith product continuously expand more publishers cover all financial market data. And so like if done right, then every month the number of symbols will go up the number of users will go up the number of publishers will go up and um and the rewards is kind of the, one of the incentives and levers that you know that we have to to make sure that happens why did you guys mike you, got, you guys could have done the token drop a, a different way so when i hear about pith and this has been a really interesting conversation it's a very b2b business right it's like it's b2b to c in a, in a sense but really it's a b2b business i think um why focus on the on the C part of this instead of just going direct, like instead of really just focusing on the applications that that have built on Pith. Yeah, I think it's within the ethos of, of crypto. Um, you know, you have to take a view that there are going to be people that want to participate in open source projects. Um, that's my view. And I think that, you know, it's the reason why Jump, Virtue, and Jane Street are all doing this is because it's open sourced, um, that there's an incentive mechanism that they can contribute. They can step in and out of participation. Um, and we wanted to open up the door to as many participants as possible. Um, there are smart people who will begin to participate within Pith governance that aren't necessarily publishers today. Um, and, you know, I think that it's important to bring in the best minds and invite the best minds to be able to do this. So, um, you know, in short, it's a cast the net as wide as possible, see who shows up and can, you know, kind of join and, and, and really wants to contribute because we've been blown away with some of the people that have just learned about the Pith network and now are looking for ways that they can contribute. Um, so our awareness has gone up dramatically um, and, you know, we're seeing people that are basically becoming a tribal around Pith. Like they're, 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 they're very bought into kind of the, vi the vision and the mission. Um, we're getting lots of applications for, um, for any positions that we have open on Dura Labs. Um, I think that's really the idea around it. It's, you know, make this so that it can be distributed and it doesn't have to always be, you know, kind of building up a hu huge treasury war chest that can become like a huge company and then becomes extractive. You know, the ethos is like build the best Oracle. And if that's the end goal of the mission and you don't need to build anything further, then great. Then Pith lives as, as an Oracle product and you can kind of leave it. 
as opposed to like, you know, the, the exchanges, which is, well, what are you going to do this year? How are you going to increase your revenues by 5% so that Wall Street's happy? You know, that's not really the ethos of, of, of crypto. Yeah. Mike, man, appreciate the conversation. I have a feeling this will be the, the first of many that we have about Pith in the future. And uh, yeah, excited to see what you guys do. So thanks for coming on. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Be well. Congrats. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching today's episode. Really hope you enjoyed it. We wanted to take a second to just remind you about our upcoming Digital Assets Summit in London, March 18th to 20th. Santi and I got your back, seats are limited, and we hooked you up with a 20% off discount code. It is Empire20. If you heard it earlier in the podcast, there's a little competition running at Blockworks to see who can drive the most number of tickets. So when you register for the Digital Assets Summit, make sure you use our code Empire20. See you in London.